Good day, this is Job Aguas and welcome to my lectures in philosophy. This is the last lecture on theories on reality or metaphysics. And for this lecture, I will focus on process and phenomenological metaphysics. Uh, we have already discussed uh, the first parts or the first philosophers in Western metaphysics. And we can see that since the time of the pre-Socratics, Plato and Aristotle during the ancient Greek period, to St. Augustine and St. Thomas during the medieval period, to the rationalists, namely Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, and even the empiricists like Hume during the modern period, to Kant and to Hegel, um, the focus, the main focus of their conception about reality or about being was on substance. So they discuss about the various um, versions of substance, whether this substance um, is the first object or the material or spiritual or substance as corporeal or divine. The main focus is always about what is this substance? So Hegel have said rather accurately that the history of Western philosophy has been the tendency towards substance. And this notion of substance affirms reality and being as something that is fixed and permanent. There is something in reality that is unchanging and absolute. And this sustains reality. So we normally refer to it as being. So substance and being are quite interchangeable in Western metaphysics. Now, there is a different conception of being or of substance. And that is the conception of process philosophy. Let's focus now on process metaphysics. The notion of substance in being in the previous uh, philosophies as being fixed and permanent have been countered by the notions of becoming. The notions of permanence, immutability, and constancy have been balanced by the notion of change, becoming, and process. So that we can see that in the history of metaphysics, the notion of change, becoming, and process have interpierced the landscape of metaphysics, especially the metaphysics of substance and being. Packets of process thought, particularly as supplementary elements to being substance position, and sometimes partly as independent process philosophical explorations, have been part of the ongoing discussion, especially in contemporary, contemporary philosophy, have been part of this philosophical discussion about the nature of being or what is reality. Heraclitus, for example, uh, have added the idea of flux or change into the pre-Socratic discourse about the ultimate principle of reality. The Neoplatonic philosopher Plotinus introduced the thought that dynamism of being is the emanation of the divine. Even Leibniz, his notion of the monads, can be interpreted as process-based. Hegel and Nietzsche also emphasize the priority of change and temporality over substances and essences. So the guiding idea of process philosophy is that natural existence consists in modes of becoming and types of occurrences. The process philosophers agree that the world is an assembly of physical, organic, social, and cognitive processes that interact with one another across levels of dynamic organization. So although process philosophers debate about how such a world of process is to be construed, how it relates to the human mind, considered as another process, and how the dynamic nature of reality 
relates to our scientific theories. So, while the process thought have made its mark even during the pre-Socratic period, process philosophy is a relatively new theory which positions itself as opposed to the substance metaphysics or the metaphysics of being which have dominated Western metaphysics since the ancient times. Um, in the long history of Western philosophy, reality has always been explained through the notion of being, and being has always been identified with existence. So a being is anything that exists in itself, and being is a substance, and this substance uh, can be material or concrete, spiritual or divine, extended or mental, logical or real. So as we have discussed the notion of substance in being, uh, it proceeds from the intuition, first formulated by the Persocratic, uh, Socratic Greek philosophers, especially Parmenides, that being should be thought of as simple, hence an internally undifferentiated and unchangeable something. Subsequent metaphysicians who subscribe to this idea of being in substance would claim that the primary units of reality called substances must be static. They must be what they are at any instance okay, in time. Now, in contrast to this view of reality, with its fundamental focus on being and what there is, process philosophers analyze becoming and what is occurring as well as ways of occurring. This view stresses that reality is dynamic and consists of a series of processes or events. Process does not only mean that reality consists of succession of events. It also includes the claim that creativity is fundamental to the nature of things and genuine novelties emerge within the process. So, the two leading philosophers who advanced the idea of process thought in the 20th century are Henri Bergson and Alfred North Whitehead. Bergson had already implied the core of process philosophy when he said, there is change, but there are not things which change. From his work, Creative, Creative Mind. Similarly, Whitehead proclaimed the flux of things is one ultimate generalization around which we must weave our philosophical system from his work Process and Reality. Both Bergson and Whitehead went against the current of history of philosophy by emphasizing a process view over a substance view. But they also stood out among their contemporaries for trying to speculate metaphysics in a time when very few interested in it, and also many claimed that achieving a grand vision of reality was impossible. Nevertheless, they were both convinced the human mind could arrive at a coherent synthesis and understanding of reality, knowledge, and values. So let's now focus on Henry Bergson his notion of self as duration. The fundamental argument of all process philosophers is that if the basic units of reality uh, are things, meaning things, when, then it will be impossible to explain how motion, much less novelty, are possible. How can we make sense of change and emergence of new entities? But if process, spontaneity, uh, creativity are fundamental, then stability, order, and continuously existing objects can be understood as abstractions from these flux or repeated patterns within the dynamic flow. To elaborate on this, Bergson starts off with the basic concern of metaphysics. For Bergson, 
if metaphysics is the study of reality, then the, both, the best approach is to start with the reality that we know best. And there is one reality, he said, at least, which we all see from within by intuition and not by analysis or simple analysis. And that is our personality in its ever flowing uh, through time. Of flowing through time, meaning ourselves or ourself, which endures, taken from his introduction to metaphysics. So, when we look into that reality, when we look into ourself, what sort of reality does it reveal to us? And Bergson describes this reality. He said, this reality is mobility. Not things made, but things in the making. Not self-maintaining states, but only changing states exist. Rest is never more than apparent, or rather relative. The consciousness we have of our own self in its continual flux introduces us to the interior of reality. So, it introduces us to the, uh, the interior of, of reality on the model of which we must represent our realities. So, modern philosophy has always dealt with problems as to how our knowledge of our inner self can tell us about external, about the external world. Berson, however, believes that this assumes that the self is like an island of consciousness that is somehow isolated and separated from the world. For Bergson, we are part of a reality or of reality. And there is a constant two-way flow between inner and outer, between the inner self and the external world. Contrary to the fragmenting perspective of the intellect, we find our within our experience a real duration. Hence, when we intuitively make contact with our own duration, we, we are in touch with the larger stream of duration. The matter and life which fill the world are equally within us. The forces which work in all things we feel within ourselves. Whatever may be the inner essence of what is and what is done, we are of that essence. So, that's the take of Bergson about the process, philosophy of being. So, for Bergson, we can say that he goes against Kant when he said that there's no ultimate dichotomy or gap between reality as we experience or perceive and reality as it is in itself. There's no gap between the nomenon and the phenomenon. So in this sense, he followed the position of Hegel, that everything is integrated, but for Hegel, it is a kind of dialectic. And for Bergson, it's a kind of process, although he did not say that that process is a dialectical process. Unlike Hegel, who said that the process is dialectic. But if there's something common between Bergson and Hegel, it is the fact that both acknowledge process as part of the development of reality. Okay, now let's go to the next white hand. Reality as process. So, Whitehead starts with the conviction that process is the fundamental feature of all reality. To be actual, he says, is to be in process. Things that appear permanent and unmoving are nothing but abstractions from the basic reality. In the surface, reality appears to be unchanging, but they appear to be 
permanent rather, unchanging and impermanent, giving us the impression that there is an underlying substance or a permanent being beneath it. So, for example, uh, we may see what may appear to be a log uh, floating on a river, but on closer look, we discover that it is actually a dense school of fish rapidly swimming together in one direction. Or when we view the sky at night, we see an almost motionless night sky with all the stars in the moon motionless. Uh, so it's uh, they appear to be in their exact and permanent location. But science will tell us that all these heavenly bodies are actually constantly moving through space and time. And that what appears to the naked eyes is nothing but just an appearance of an event that is long finished or gone. What we actually see is just an appearance or a trace of a process that was over long time ago. So, according to Whitehead, in our initial judgment or assessment of reality, we committed the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, which means that what we thought of, uh, of as a single large motionless mass was actually a very superficial appearance of the primary reality that was a collection of rapidly moving individual objects like for example a school of fish circling around or moving together at one point in the river or heavenly bodies staying motionless in their respective location in the sky but while reality is a temporal process it is not one indivisible flow. According to, according to Whitehead, reality is made up of basic, irreducible, discrete units, kind of auto atomism. But these units are not the bits of matter of scientific materialism, but are events or momentary happenings. What Whitehead would call actual entities okay actual entities or actual vocations so this uh if we go to scientific materialism it maintains that the spatial extension of an entity is crucial to its identity but uh, its temporal extension is not now whitehead disagrees with this conception he said, entities or ultimate entities have both spatial and ex uh, spatial extension and temporal extension. And both features are equally important. Entities do not just have a certain location or space. They have a certain temporal duration. Okay. So, the ultimate entities that make up reality or more like is, is uh, the, these ultimate entities that make up reality are more like a sneeze, sneeze, in that their temporal extension is, as, is an important feature of their identity as their spatial extension. So consider the time it takes a sneeze to occur. We do not have a sneeze lasting half as long because we have only half a sneeze. The sneeze is a complete entity lasting through several moments of time. So its existence is possible only if it has a certain temporal duration. The fundamental units of reality, the actual entities, have this same feature. He explains how an actual entity becomes constitutes what that actual entity is. Its being is constituted by its becoming. Even God is to be understood in terms of this basic category. God is an actual entity and so is the most trivial puff of existence is 
far off empty space. A particular event or actual occasion can be, for example, a single vibration of an electron that is one among the many momentary vibrations that make up the series of events we collectively call the electron. Another type of actual occasion could be a single momentary event in our, in our stream of consciousness, like a twinge of pain or the perception of a flash of light. So, Whitehead agrees with the other metaphysicians that there must be a unified picture of reality. Descartes, for example, have earlier divided the world into two kinds of realities, minds and bodies, or res cogitans and res extensa. But for Whitehead, the problem with this dualism, or with Cartesian dualism, was that the two realities were so different it was not clear how they are or they were related. The materialists ag argued that this showed we need a unified theory of reality in which there are no breaks in nature. Hence, they reproduce or they reduce all reality to a collection of physical particles in motion and try to explain mental events as particular kinds of material motions. Whitehead, however, said that the materialist has started with the wrong model. He started with the wrong model. If we start with inert hunks or chunks of matter without interior life, we can never explain the phenomenon of subjective feeling. Whitehead suggests that our metaphysics will be more successful if we try or if we start with our own experience of subjective feelings. Meaning, if we start with our own experience of being subjective centers of feelings. Whitehead extends these subjective feelings to entities like electrons or crystals, but they are low level examples. So Whitehead draws the extraordinary conclusion that no entity in reality is devoid of subjective experience. Accordingly, he describes actual entities as brief but unified drops of experience. Drops of experience. So for Whitehead, feeling can range from those feelings we are fully conscious of, like for example, headache, and to, to those we are only dimly aware of and that are recessed in the background of our conscious experience, like for example, our, the, the feeling of our general body state, okay? all the way down to unconscious feelings. For example, the bodily experience we have when we, when we are asleep. Other organisms, even a worm or an amoeba, have very low levels of feeling. But even at the very low level, they are active feeling and valuing. They are active, they feel, and they, they, have, they are valuing subjects. Even though they have no conscious awareness, they respond to their environment and seek out conditions conducive to their survival. So, for Whitehead, feeling can range from those feelings, meaning uh, can extend to the other entities in nature, even if uh, they are not alive, even to non-living entities or inanimate entities, because they are also active centers of energy. So, even the electrons feel their environment, and respond to it, which they are not passive entities mechanically imposed, you know, imposed on by external forces. Instead, they have active, they're active centers of energy whose characteristics are substantially affected by the way in which they incorporate their environment and respond to it by becoming 
excited, agitated, attracted, and repelled. Thus, the difference between the entities studied by the psychologists and those studied by physicists is only a difference of degree of their feeling. And therefore, for Whitehead, every entity has a feeling for its, meaning, uh, every entity has a feeling for it is a center of energetic activity. The energetic activity considered in physics is the emotional intensity entertained in life. Now, such view is regarded as a kind of panpsychism, the claim that everything in reality has some degree of mental life. So that's the process uh, metaphysics of Bergson and Whitehead. Now let's go to the other kind of metaphysics or ontology in contemporary in the contemporary period. And now we are going to focus on phenomenological ontology. The landscape of philosophy took a different contour with the thought of the existentialists and the phenomenologists. There were some significant changes in its character, in its subjects of discussions, and in its approach as an intellectual discipline. So from the notion of God, nature, the metaphysical, and the abstract, which has always been the interest of the past, these philosophers, namely the, psycho the uh, existentialists and the phenomenologists, shifted their attention to a more practical subject, and that is the question that concerned man most, his existence, the meaning of his existence. So for them, especially for the existentialists, the question that philosophy should try to answer in its search for truth is the meaning of human existence. The search for truth became the search for meaning. Man has the task of discovering and giving meaning to his existence. Man as the subject is the giver and discoverer of being. So in order to accomplish this, they follow the Cartesian first-person standpoint. But they shifted their attention from the foundation of human cognition to the foundation of human existence and human action. The existentialists and the phenomenologists, however, are not just focused on human subject or the human person. They are also concerned with reality. And two of the leading uh, phenomenologists, leading existentialists and phenomenologists are Edmund Husserl and Martin Heidegger. So Husserl developed the phenomenological method and applied that to human cognition. Heidegger, on the other hand, who was for a time a student of, of Husserl, followed the phenomenological method or approach, but he applied it to ontology and applied uh, ontology and anthropology or the human subject, which he referred to as the Dasein. So let's start with Husserl's phenomenology. Husserl was critical of the natural sciences, especially with the viewpoint known as naturalism, which claims that physical nature encompasses everything real and that all reality can be exclusively explained by natural sciences. This idea of naturalism, however, implies that consciousness itself is not just is just another item of nature that can be explained by the laws of physics, chemistry, and biology. Husserl argued that if consciousness and our beliefs are just products of blind uh, and irrational physical causes, then we cannot have rational justified beliefs. And therefore Husserl dismissed all theories that undermine the foundation of knowledge in consciousness. So for Husserl, 
the essential aim of philosophy is to be a rigorous science. That is uh, a, a kind of science whose scientific character is very much different from the sciences of nature and of the mind. So unlike philosophy, the sciences, meaning the natural sciences uh, and the sciences of the mind, usually have at their disposal an elaborate system of refined methods, the scientific method. Thus, an ordinary observer will get the impression that philosophy is less scientific and less rational because it does not have a very refined method, a system of refined method. However, according to Husserl, these non-philosophical sciences start from a complex presuppositions and assumptions which these uh, which these sciences have not clarified themselves. Philosophy, on the other hand, does not want to leave anything unsolved. Thus, according to Husserl, philosophy must reduce everything to primary presuppositions, okay, which do not need to be clarified because they are themselves immediately evident. It is in the sense that philosophy is the science of ultimate grounds. Okay. Now, for Husserl, in order to achieve this, he proposed the method of phenomenology. The method of phenomenology, which not only guides us in discovering new truth, but also enables us to test the rational adequacy of any truth claims. His understanding of phenomenology has affinities with Hegel's work entitled The Phenomenology of Spirit. For Hegel and Husserl, phenomenology is a systematic study of the phenomena, or what appears within experience. They both deny that there is a meaningful content that exists in reality that is inaccessible to reason. And therefore, both philosophers avoided the trap that Kant fell into when he postulated the unknowable things in themselves or the nomina. So, the <clears throat> The goal of Husserl is to find an approach to philosophical truth that will be presuppositionless. It means that philosophers should not use any of any assumption in their investigation that have not been thoroughly examined, clarified, and justified. So the phenomenological method involves taking a certain stance towards experience. And according to Husserl, all experiencing prior to phenomenological investigation is characterized by what he called uh, the natural standpoint or natural attitude. So this natural attitude, this natural attitude was used by Husserl to refer to the predominant attitude of the other sciences. And that is viewing, the way of viewing the world based on a number of unquestioned and implicit assumptions. Okay. The most basic assumption is that the external world is a spatiotemporal realm which exists independently of our consciousness and consists of objects that experience reveals to us. So, in a natural attitude, man's perception and thinking are wholly turned towards things. The natural standpoint or the natural attitude looks at reality as things and regards reality as fragmented, fixed, precise, and manipulative. So it looks at the world simply as a fact world. In our everyday life, we are immersed in our practical concerns and carry on our dealings with other people and things in terms of this standpoint. This is what Husserl calls the taken-for-granted stance. 
taken for granted in stance. That we just take for granted things, reality. Okay? Uh, we just go about our daily concerns. Now, Husserl criticized this uh, natural standpoint of the sciences, arguing that the sciences were getting farther away from reality. And therefore, we have to go back to reality. Or, in other words, we have to go back to the things themselves. So this means a return to the immediate original data of our consciousness. Philosophy, according to Husserl, lies in an entirely different dimension. It needs a, uh, it needs new starting points and an entirely new method, which is in principle different from those of the natural science. So the aim of philosophy then, according to Husserl, implies a radicalism of foundation, a reduction, okay, a, uh, a reduction to absolute presuppositionless, a fundamental method through which the philosopher at the beginning at the very start, secures an absolute foundation for himself. So, for Husserl, the absolute starting point of philosophy is not in any single fundamental principle or in one simple cogito, as Descartes did. Although, when he tried to came up with the foundation of knowledge, he was also doing a la Descartes trying to establish uh, knowledge on a solid foundation. But for him, the foundation of knowledge, the absolute starting point of philosophy is not a simple cogito, but in an entire field of regional experiences. Regional field of experiences. So, this starting point of phenomenology is the field of primordial phenomena. And within this field, Husserl does not want any induction or deduction, but solely intuition on the basis of a very exact analysis and description of experience. So, intuition or experience for Husserl is a legitimate source of knowledge. Intuition, however, implies, okay, it implies that subject and object are present are present to each other in the same level thus intuition de demands that we first try to arrive at the lowest level at the lowest field of work or the lowest level of work at this point Husserl relies on his reductions okay his the method of phenomenological reduction. Now, this phenomenological reduction is the methodic procedure by which one places oneself in the transcendental sphere. That is the sphere in which we can perceive things as they really are in themselves, independent of any prejudice. Okay? And we can only arrive at this level without any prejudice if we do the epithet or bracketing. So, in other words, it is a change of attitude by virtue of which we learn to see things we previously thought to be to perceive in a different way. This is in an original and radical way. So, by reduction, we penetrate deeper into things and learn to see the more profound layers behind what we first thought to see. The purpose of reduction is to satisfy the demands of phenomenology, and that is to guarantee the purity of description and to aid in the discovery of the essences or the eidos, which are important to Husserl's analysis of necessary truth. So the reduction assures us that the object, the object described by phenomenology will be the phenomenon or the intentional object of experience. 
Okay? So, let's go to the last part of this discussion. Heidegger's Fundamental Ontology. For existentialist, con for the existentialist, consciousness is not to be interpreted primarily as a knowing consciousness, but as an acting, willing, and deciding consciousness. And this is one difference between Husserl and the phenomenology or, and the existentialist. So while the existence, many of the existentialists follow the phenomenological method of Husserl, they did not apply or they did not take consciousness as a knowing consciousness the way Husserl understood consciousness, but rather as an acting, willing, and deciding consciousness. So for the existentialist, the paradigms to be examined are not those experiences related to knowing and reasoning, but rather the experience of doing, participating, choosing, and even loving. Now, like Husserl, they are concerned with the nature of our consciousness. However, they disagree with his description of human consciousness. While it is true that we know about objects in the world, or that we are conscious about the objects in the world. For the existential phenomenologists, our primary orientation towards object is to use them. Okay? To use them. To regard them as tools. Okay? So, phenomenology cannot describe the objects of the world without paying attention to what we do with them or what we know about them. Husserl's drawback was to suppose that our primary commerce with things was to know them, and that our primary relationship with the world was first and foremost to know it, not to live in it. So, the ideal description of the things in themselves must not be a description of internal objects without regard for the person or subject who is conscious of them. So, the uh, description should also pay attention not only to the intentional acts which are cognitive, but also the acts which involve, uh, which involve caring, desiring, manipulating, and the other acts of concrete existing object like, as we have mentioned, loving, uh, deciding, etc., etc. So, Heidegger developed this viewpoint, this idea of consciousness as being involved in other things, in other acts, aside from just knowing or uh, cognizing. Okay? So, in his basic work, Being in Time, he described phenomenology by He described phenomenology by going back to the meanings of this term, of these Greek terms, meaning, uh, namely, the, the Greek meaning, the, 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 the Greek concepts of phenomenon and logos. Phenomenon and logos. So, the term phenomenon is that which shows itself from itself. And Logos is a discourse which allows something to reveal or show itself. Therefore, when you put together Phenomenon and Logos, okay, you put together Phenomenon, the concept of Phenomenon, with the concept of Logos, it would mean let to let that which shows itself be seen from itself in the very way it shows itself from itself. That's from Heidegger's Being in Time. So a phenomenon is an event that shows itself. And this concept of phenomenology, which relied much on Aristotle rather than on Husserl, is a radical diversion from Husserl. So 
for Heidegger to give account, to give an account or to give a discourse, a logos of phenomena or a particular phenomenon meant that we need to describe beings in their disclosedness. By disclosedness, he means the way it shows itself, self-showing. To, to speak and think that one is brought to things in their disclosedness and to give an account of the shining, meaning the light, the revelation that allows their manifestness. So, disclosedness composes the lives of individual beings. In other words, for Heidegger, the phenomenon reveals itself. It discloses itself. So disclosure or disclosedness is part of the lives of individual beings. It's part of their nature as individual beings. So central to Heidegger's work, Being in Time, is the analysis of the meaning of being. So, this meaning of being, this description, this discussion of the meaning of being, is what Heidegger calls fundamental ontology. Fundamental ontology. So, Heidegger, like Husserl and Sartre, distinguish ontology from metaphysics. And, of course, they favored to use ontology instead of metaphysics. Ontology, for them, deals with being, and is primarily descriptive and classificatory. Metaphysics, on the other hand, is purposive. It purports to be causally explanatory, and it offers accounts about the ultimate origins and ends of individuals and of the universe as a whole. Therefore, metaphysics is teleological in that sense because it tells us about the purpose of reality, the purpose of a particular thing. Ontology, on the other hand, does not offer any kind of teleology. It simply describes what being or what reality is. So, for Heidegger, while his uh, method is phenomenological, his final philosophical position is ontological. Because his real concern is being. His real concern is being. What is the meaning of being? And for Heidegger, there is an ontological difference between being, which he translates as sign, okay, meaning the occurrence of disclosedness, and beings or scientists, meaning a specific instance of disclosedness. Okay? So, being or sign, being or sign, for Heidegger means to be, means to be, or becoming. Okay. So, being is becoming, to be. So, he takes being in the, in the active sense, okay, not in the static sense, active in the sense that it is in the process of becoming. So, for him, being or sign should be understood ontologically. Okay? Now, beings as entities or scientists in, uh, means that this being, the scientist, is an entity. It is already fixed and actual. It is an actual being. So, they belong to the ontical or experiential. So, for Heidegger, just to explain this, a little bit further, being sign, the sign is to become, to be. Okay, there, the, uh, something is not yet fixed. It can still become. Scientists, on the other hand, are fixed entities. They are actual being, and they belong to the ontical or to the experiential. According to Heidegger. The being of Aristotle and the other philosophers who followed him, their notion of being is actual, 
And by actual, it means fixed, closed. But the, the being of Heidegger traces its origin back to the pre-Socratics, especially of Heraclitus. And Heraclitus said that what is real is becoming the flux, the chains. So to some extent, it is somehow connected to the process of Bergson and Whitehead because they both assert that reality being is a kind of becoming, not something that is fixed, not something that is already closed or permanent. So while the central problem in the meaning is the meaning of sign or being, before the question of meaning of being, we have to inquire first about the questioner. Meaning, before we can inquire about sign, we have to question first about the questioner or the inquirer. And the questioner is the da sign. The being who is there. Okay? The being is there. there. So, the, uh, the discussion on the question about being begins with an analysis of the inquirer or the one uh, uh, the one who is capable of asking the question about being. And the question is, why is there being? What is being? Okay. And the only being, the only entity who can answer that is the Dasein. The only entity that can talk about the being of other entities is the Dasein. And therefore, the Dasein occupies a privileged position in regards to all other beings. So, the inquirer, who is the Dasein, is a being in the world. By conceiving Dasein as such, Heidegger made the ancient problem concerning the relationship and duality between subject and object rather superfluous. The basic structures of Dasein are primordial moodness, understanding, and speech, which are found on the temporalization of the Dasein. And the two basic possibilities of man's existing are those in which the Dasein either comes itself, he becomes authentic to itself, or loses itself, he he is in an inauthentic existence. Okay. So, the Dasein is inauthentic when it lets the possibilities of the choice for its existence be given to it by others instead of deciding for itself. Why Dasein? Why is the question about Dasein as priority over the question of being? explains that the Dasein takes priority because it is the only entity in the ontical, meaning in the experiential level, which has existence ontologically. So Heidegger makes a distinction between the ontological and experiential. When, when, when he talks of the ontological, he's talking of the meaning of being. What, is, what, what does it mean to be? And when he talks about the ontical or experiential level, he's talking about in the, uh, well, yes, in the experiential level, about in the level of entities, level of, you know, actual beings, among these actual beings. There's no other being that can reflect, that can think of what it means to be but the Dasein himself. Because the Dasein has existence. Only Dasein has existence. And what is this existence? Existence means to stand out. It means that the Dasein can stand out of itself and see himself from the outside. Only the Dasein can do this, standing out and looking into itself. And reflect about itself. The ability to have such an attitude towards 
oneself, understand oneself in regard to its possibilities of being, is the distinctive mark of an entity characterized by existence. And therefore, for Heidegger, existence is exclusive to man or to the Dasein himself. And this points to a fundamental ontology, which offers an analysis of the mode of being of the inquirer and its basic structures. So, although we cannot grasp being, we can see the distinction between being or between Dasein and the other entities. So, the Dasein is distinguished from all other entities by the fact that he builds up a certain relationship with himself. This position of Heidegger marks another contrast to the substance metaphysics that dominated the history of Western philosophy. So that ends our discussion on Heidegger's fundamental ontology. Thank you very much for listening.